It is 10.30 a.m. here on Tuesday, 24th of August, 2021. Sorry, I'm trying to get my bearings here. I um, understand the moment why. My name is Aaron Hunt. I'm a partner here at Stace Hammond. I head up the immigration team. Uh, as always, this video is not legal advice. It is merely our commentary on immigration here in New Zealand. If you're looking for legal advice, please get in contact uh, at the email in the description down below. There hasn't really been much uh, to do a video on in the past few weeks. There's been a few small changes for select groups, but nothing that would really impact uh, many of you. The only change is that it was reported yesterday that MIQ spots uh, that are opening uh, are due, that are open but are, are being cancelled or sort of you know, replenished back into the pool will not be released to the public at this time. Now, the official statement from MIQ is that MIQ is temporarily pausing the release of rooms on the managed isolation allocation system due to the current COVID-19 outbreak. This includes cancelled vouchers that are normally re-released. -re no rooms will be available to book for a few days. Updates we posted here relating uh, being the MBIE Twitter account. Now we'll provide a update uh, in our next video for that. The other thing to note is that we are back into lockdown and will be for some time. Actually, the background here is fake. Uh, I'm not in my office, I'm in my apartment. Uh, which you can see if I sort of wave my hand that it's sort of, yeah, showing like that. Um, so, and also the video is a little bit um, janky. I am using my camera through my laptop, which isn't as smooth as normal. Um, Today's video, we wanted to focus on living together. It's probably the most discussed item for immigration in the past 10 months and one that in which there's a lot of misinformation uh, going about. We'll look at the definition, the application, the misinformation, and what it means for those of you who are applying to bring partners into New Zealand. Uh, as we often do, we'll be referring a couple of times to the operational manual, which is the rules that Immigration New Zealand um, apply. If you, are, if you do hear us refer to a letter, then a number such as E4, um, then this is a reference to the operational manual. So for E4530, it will be E4, which is the generic temporary entry section on, um, on lodging and application, subpage five, which is about temporary entry class visas for partners and dependent children, then instruction 30 on that page. We're referring to that one a lot today, um, as that is the rule about living together. We'll provide a link at, uh, in the, to the page in the description down below, um, so you can go look at it at yourself, but we will also bring it onto the screen, uh, which is why I'm using Zoom actually for this meeting, so I can easily bring up um, my screen so you can see what I'm looking at. Now, what is living together? Now, prior to the pandemic, INZ had two distinct ways of looking at a relationship. There was genuine and stable, and then there was living together. So for a partnership visa, uh, with the exception being culturally arranged marriages, there was a requirement for partners to be living together in a genuine and stable relationship. Now, genuine and stable is defined in E4525. Living together is this defined at E4530. We'll look at both of those um, in the video today. One does not reference the other. They're only brought together when a particular visa type asks for people to be living together in a genuine and stable relationship. Now, this is how it's always been interpreted prior to the pandemic. It's how it's always been um, looked at by Immigration New Zealand. Uh, but we'll look at that later in the video as to how it's been looked at now. Now, the important factor here is, e, is in E4530. We're going to bring it up on our screen now. So here we are in E45. So you see there E45, the E4, E45, and then E4530 is down here. We'll provide a link um, to this in the description below. Now, E4530 is living together. Now, you'll see here there's two factors here. First is the partner must be sharing the same house as partners. Um, we'll show the definition for partner in a moment. Uh, now, during the pandemic, INZ, particularly with CPVV applications, have modified this so that instead of it being that they are sharing the same house, there's become that they have at some point shared the same house or lived together. Um, the second part provides some exclusions. Now, it excludes shared accommodation during holidays together, flatmate arrangements. Um, so you need to be sharing it as partners, not flatmates, and any other living arrangements that do not reflect a stable, um, do not reflect the factors in E4535A, which is how you determine whether you've lived together in a genuine stable relationship. Um, now, the important thing here, though, is the first one is the time spent in each other's homes while still maintaining individual residences. And... This is where people will often have issues. 
But as I said, genuine and stable and living together were previously not seen as being reliant on each other. Their application together merely came through rules such as E4535, determining if the couple are living together in a partnership that is genuine and stable. However, in mid-November 2020, after the CPVV applications had been opened for a little while, there was applications for uh, partners to come into the country for uh, partners of residents and citizens. Suddenly, we were being told that a couple can only be deemed as genuine and stable if they had lived together. Now, the wording for inclusion for a partner under a CPVV is seen in H52515F, which we'll look at down here. H5, which is special, special temporary visas. H5... 25 determining and then 15 if the partner dependent child or legal guardian of a New Zealand citizen or residence class visa holder. Um, now that is for non visa waiver country people. Uh, for those from visa waiver countries, it is H615 is the factor here. Um, now, as we see in H52515F, It refers to the partner, it doesn't state as to how that is defined. Now, if we look down further, we see H52520. Now, this is a person will be considered to be a partner of a New Zealand citizen or permanent residence um, if they meet the requirements for a partner specified in E4.1. So it's getting us to redirect to a, another page once again. Now, actually, that's going to be E4.1.20. So if we'll go to here, you'll see down here definition of a partner is E4120, um, and you have to meet one of these criterias and meet this criteria. So it has to be legally married, civil union, de facto. Uh, de facto is for those of you who won't be married, but you're in a relationship, you will be de um, defined as de facto most likely, and genuine and stable. Now you notice there's no reference here at all to living together as being a requirement. So by the way it is written, there is no requirement for living together for these applications. We've sort of followed it through from the H52515S through to E4.120, and there's no requirement as a partner to be living together to meet that criteria. And we argued this with Immigration New Zealand, and we were told that genuine and stable can only be seen when partners have lived together. So unless you've lived together, you cannot state that your relationship is genuine and stable because living together creates some sort of extra pressure or some element of the relationship which you won't have be aware of having just been genuine and stable, no matter how long you've been in a relationship with each other. Now, of course, we disagree with that, that approach and we uh, note that it does go against their own instructions and it goes against a number of cultures or religious, religions that generally discourage living together before certain uh, points in the relationship. Then on 10th of May 2021, um, Immigration New Zealand slipped in a new line into these uh, instructions. It's going to show that, that now. Now we'll see that they brought in on that date, 10th of May, they brought into H525 family relationships for the avoidance of doubt and purposes of A, C, and E above, a person will only be considered to have met the requirements of partnership if they have also lived together. So they have now sort of, I suppose, clarified their approach. But again, it was an approach that was not in place until November 2020. Prior to that, there was no requirement for genuine and stable to have lived together. Um, relationships can be genuine and stable without having lived together. However, that is the uh, that has now cemented um, that interpretation into the rules. So it is the the rules that we have to now follow. So we're going to look at how we're going to apply this for um, applicants. What this means is to be living together, you cannot have another home. So the couples must be living in the same home and have no other residence that they could have live they could live in. This becomes difficult, particularly for those who have entered into an arranged marriage or are married to someone they only see from time to time. So if you apply, the immigration officer will have a look at whether you have lived together, whether you have had another place at the same time where you could have been living. Um, so if you kept a home in New Zealand or they suspect you kept a home in New Zealand, then they won't believe you, are, you have lived together. 
Similarly, if it was a short period of time that you were together, they may see it as being a holiday rather than living together. Now, this is where some misinformation does come in. And we see this on a daily basis in the various forums and WhatsApp groups. As you'll have seen in those uh, the rules we went through there, there is no minimum period. Um, we see people saying three months all the time, and, and well, that's a lie, it's completely untrue. We've been seeing people say three months um, are required for a partnership visa for years. This is not a new thing. Uh, it happened long before the pandemic. People would say to us, hey, we got told that it was three months required um, to, to go for a partnership visa. The reason we saw this previously, at least we assumed the reason, is that it is easier to get a client a partnership visa when they can provide um, months of evidence rather than just a week of evidence. So before the pandemic, when people were actually living together in New Zealand, we could put applications in when they've been together, living together for like a day or two. We often have clients who have come into the country to be with their partner on a visitor visa. They arrive in the country, they'd start living with their partner and we'd put an application through for partnership within days of them arriving within the country pre-pandemic. Um, and that was a, it was more difficult to get it through, of course, with that short time period, but it was not impossible. There was no fixed requirement, but would also hear some people saying to their client, no, no, it requires three months because it makes it easier for the person who's handling the application. So this three months figure seems to have carried through the, to the pandemic from the pre-pandemic. Um, and if it is true that those who are living together for a shorter period of time will find it more difficult to get a visa on average than those who have been living together for a longer period of time, um, this doesn't, but it doesn't come down to the minimum number of days, but rather the limited amount of evidence that can be provided, which would have been gathered in the shorter period. The longer you live together, the more likely you are to have better evidence. So we've seen people who have had just weeks together, living together, um, getting CPVVs, while those who have had three months or more being declined. It isn't the time period, but it's the evidence that they can provide to show that they have met the requirements um, under E4530. The other issue with the misinformation is that it gives people um, either unrealistic views about their applications or about going to fetch their partners. Now, for those of you who don't know, a fetch is where the partner goes to live with the partner on the basis that they are creating living together evidence. On listening to the misinformation, um, they believe that after three months together, they will get a border exception. So they'll, they'll leave the country, go offshore, spend three months there, apply for a visa, and then get very confused as to why they were declined, feeling that it was sort of an attack on them or it was a, a racist thing. When in reality, um, it comes down to that they are not actually meeting that criteria of living together. Um, as they will often still have a residence here in New Zealand and Immigration New Zealand will probably be aware of that. They can, they can see that, or at least it hasn't been shown to them that they have met the criteria of e, um, E4530 by not having a residence in New Zealand. It's up to the applicant to show immigration these things rather than Immigration New Zealand sort of seeking that information out. So those who keep on saying, you know, three months minimum really should rather be saying meet the requirements of E4530 because that is what the, the, the minimum is, that you have met that criteria and that you can show it to Immigration New Zealand. So what does this mean for those who want to bring their partners to New Zealand? Well, it means that at the moment it is difficult. You need to be able to show that you have lived together and at the same time that you haven't maintained a residence, um, another residence at another location, primarily in New Zealand. This is easy for people who have lived, who are living offshore when they start living with their partner. So for those who are living offshore for several years, meet their partner and live together and then apply, that's much easier to show they haven't maintained a residence because Immigration New Zealand are gonna, well, assume that they are living together in that location. Um, for those who leave New Zealand to be with their partner, it's more difficult because unless you can show that you have um, cut off that residence in New Zealand, Immigration New Zealand are likely going to assume that you still maintain it. It also comes down to the evidence. Uh, you need to show that you're both at the same address offshore. Now, there is no set of documents that you must have or must provide. Um, so even though documents like lease agreements are definitely useful, they aren't a set requirement. We hear that once in a while, misinformation about that. It's not a set requirement. It is a, a suggested requirement and that you can provide that would be of use. 
Um, we're seeing a lot of different evidence used actually, and some actually quite ingenious evidence that our clients have provided. And it can often be about, come down to the evidence that you provide, the ingenious of it, you know, what it provides, but also about how you present it to Immigration New Zealand. A big lump of documents probably won't be as useful as it being brought together in something that's cohesive and um, shows the relationship, shows how it develops, shows you know, when you came together, when you moved, shows you cutting off that, that residencies in New Zealand, shows that various things and puts it together as one cohesive story or package. Um, so it often comes down as to how it's shown to immigration as, to, as well as to what is actually in, contained in it. And that's often something we can assist with because uh, we do a lot of. So for those leaving New Zealand to be with your partner, you may need to show evidence that you didn't maintain the New Zealand residence. So we've done it in a number of different ways, but for some of our clients, we've seen evidence of rental bonds being refunded to bank accounts. That's a, a really good one to show. Uh, New Zealand Post can provide a letter showing that your mail is being forwarded to that offshore uh, address. Now, evidence that, that, that you showed in different, different, different locations before and after you left New Zealand. So perhaps you lived in you know, Auckland, you went offshore, Next thing you know, you come back to New Zealand, you're living in Wellington. So you haven't maintained a residence in between because you've gone from city to city. So that is uh, another option. So while we still see some decisions as that people get as being unfair, we do see a correlation between evidence uh, given and the likelihood of being granted. So if it's good evidence and it's presented well, we see more results coming through uh, with, with these as granted than those who provide very little evidence or just make an assumption that if they apply, they're going to get a visa. Um, this, however, leaves many of those who are in arranged marriages stuck. You know, when do they have lived together? It's often following the wedding. One party will often have maintained a residence in New Zealand because the intention is that the parties will eventually move to New Zealand. Making those months spent together after the wedding, not meeting the criteria for living together. So if you went offshore, you were married, you spent three or four months with your partner and then returned to your house, which you maintained in New Zealand, you haven't lived together as Immigration New Zealand defines it. At the time that took place, it, was, it was, wasn't likely that anybody thought this would take place and you would need to prove that you've lived together. So you probably never thought about um, you know, leasing that property you had in New Zealand or in the lease or finding some way to show that because no one thought of the pandemic coming through. Unfortunately, now it's leaves you in a position where that evidence is, is evidence that uh, Immigration New Zealand is unlikely to, to accept because it doesn't really show you living together. It shows that you maintained a residence in New Zealand. So for, th for those of you in that situation, all I have to say is before you head off offshore to try and bring your partners in, get legal advice. Um, otherwise, you could find it as a very expensive trip, especially if you go across there now uh, into a, a dangerous area and you still maintain your residence in New Zealand. All that time you are offshore, you will not be living together with your partner as defined by Immigration New Zealand. And that is it for today's video. Uh, we hope it's provided a bit of clarity for those who are looking to bring your partner from offshore. Uh, I know it is a difficult situation for a lot of you, but Hopefully this helps to some degree. Um, we will be back with more information when it becomes available. If there is anything you wanted to talk about, please let us know. Um, we are currently pretty busy, so I'm trying to get through the inquiries when I can. Um, but it is a, a busy time with everything going on. Uh, until next time, kia kaha, stay safe, keep your masks on, and we'll come back to you uh, when we can.